continuing our series on Introduction to Theology. In this episode, we will talk about the different sources of theology and the roles they play in major Christian traditions and some Protestant sub-traditions. Ultimately, our source of theology, knowing God, must come from God Himself. We cannot know God unless He chooses to reveal Himself. But even what He reveals about Himself is limited to what He chooses to. We will call this Holy Spirit-inspired or God-breathed revelation. They were spoken and then written by the prophets and by the apostles, which includes the preaching and teaching of our Lord Jesus, the Son of God, as they are now recorded in our number one source, the Scriptures or the Christian Bible. Its composition and role, however, depend on which Christian tradition you will ask. For Protestants, the Christian Bible has 66 books, 39 from the Old Testament, and 27 from the New Testament. What the Protestant recognize in the Old Testament are the exact same number of books the Jews recorded in their Council of Jamnia in Yabne after the destruction of the Temple in AD 70. The story surrounding this council, however, remains in dispute and even refuted by scholars like F. F. Bruce, who said the canon of the Jews most likely happened much later. The Jewish Publication Society, founded in 1845, first published their Hebrew Bible in 1917. Catholics, on the other hand, have seven more books, which as a group are called the Deuterocanonicals, or the Second Canon. Protestants reject this group, calling them Apocryphal, which means hidden, spurious, or false canon. The Catholic Church, however, according to them, has confirmed this Deuterocanonical since the Council of Rome in AD 382 and then in the Council of Trent in 1545. The Orthodox, on the other hand, have eight more than Catholics and 15 more than the Protestants. The list of books they recognize are all the books in the Septuagint, the LXX or the Greek compilation of the Old Testament from the mid-3rd century BC. They don't recognize the Council of Rome, by the way, but it depends on which patriarchal center, whether they all read this, the Euterocanonicals, in their service. It is also worth mentioning that there are other Christian sects, or sectas, because they all have additional scriptures. For example, the Mormons have the Book of Mormon, Doctrines and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price, on top of the KJV 1611 or the King James Version English translation of the Bible. Other sects have their own preferred translations. For example, the King James Only Movement are Christian fundamentalists who recognize the inspiration of KJV 1611, yet they still reject the Apocryphas in it. Then we have the Jehovah's Witnesses, who also recognize 1611 of KJV over any other English translations, but they also have a custom-made translation called the New World Translation, which only they recognize. Last example is from the Living Stream Ministries, also called Church of Recovery by Witness Lee. They also have custom-made translation only recognized by their sect, and it is called Recovery Version. Of course, we are not endorsing any of these other than the 66 books of the Protestant Bible, but we will take up this issue once again in Bibliology when we talk about canon, inspiration, and inerrancy. So don't forget to subscribe. Next is Reason, part of Natural Theology we mentioned in Part 1. We also use reason in order to reflect upon what God revealed from scriptures, as well as the universe that God created, which declares His glory, Psalm 19.1, that even pagans can acknowledge, Acts 17.28. But since our capacity for logical, rational, and analytic thought is limited, this is where it often gets blurry. There are many factors. Number one, our ignorance affects our reading of scriptures or our reflection of creation. 
Number two, sin blurs our understanding of them. Number three, indoctrination, training, or upbringing condition our mind with certain prejudices. Number four, epistemology too that we have already discussed. For Christians to surrender their own use of reason further blurs their understanding by giving up their own critical thinking and discernment and by their absolute reliance on someone else interpreting the scriptures for them could turn them into brainwashed or mindless cult. The believers at Berea have set a good example for every Christian to imitate in Acts 17.11. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So we really need the help and guidance of the Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds, and humility on our part, and the teachers of the church to help guide us to the right direction. We'll talk more about illumination and interpreting the scriptures when we get into hermeneutics. Third is tradition, which is already part of our upbringing. They contain information handed down to us from various known and unknown sources and thus affect the way we reason, even when we interpret the scriptures. But it deserves its own place separate from reason because when we talk about this type of tradition, we're talking about historical theology, which includes the various opinions and diverse interpretations, even the consensus of those who have gone before us like from a council, creeds, and confessions. Hence, we may even call these historical interpretations, not just of the written sacred texts, but also in the form of unwritten instructions by which we practice our faith. For Catholics and Orthodox, tradition is at par with scriptures as the main source of theology, and this is their official stand. For Protestants, the scripture takes front and center. As Luther puts it, popes and council often erred and contradicted each other, and so the scripture has the final say. But this doesn't mean the Protestant will not appeal to the explanations from other Christians and creeds and councils. At least, that's the official stand. Based on experience, however, that is not always the case. Creeds and councils often become the lens by which they interpret the scriptures, and we will get back to this. For fundamentalists and other sects, they claim scripture is the only source. Nuda scriptura is what we call them. Again, that is their official stand. However, this often means scripture as interpreted by certain authority figure or figures, or by their founders. At least the Catholic Church is more honest and upfront in saying that the Pope or the Magisterium has the final say. For the experientialists and postmoderns, it's more based on subjective experience and emotion. You will often hear them say, This works for me. Whatever works for you may not work for me. Or they say, This is your interpretation, but his interpretation or my interpretation is different. What the Holy Spirit revealed to us is different, as if the Holy Spirit will contradict himself. Remember the law of non-contradiction? Or they say, that can't be correct. Or sometimes they say, that cannot be the correct meaning because that would mean God is not fair or unloving, etc. For Pentecostals and Charismatics, additional sources of theology would be the situational revelation through the dreams visions, tongues, or through the subjective experience of their duly recognized and endorsed modern-day apostles and prophets. Because of this, Presbyterian Memes proposed this in Twitter on March 18, 2015, which is from PeteOrta.com. They say these historical documents protected how the Bible was to be interpreted, but now without them, we have many Gospels. According to this view, Church history safeguards Christians from falling into heresies. Of course, what they are referring to here are the 16th century Reformed creeds and confessions. 
It has been retweeted and shared many times in Facebook pages and groups as well. According to another reform page, quoting Jude 1 verse 3 as if Jude is telling us, that the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints already included creeds and confessions of the 16th century. This is an example of a high view of creeds and confessions, which is almost the same as of the Catholics' high view of tradition. What we propose instead is like this. In sola scriptura, all interpretations, beliefs, and practices, and applications of the text, which include but not limited to apologetics, homiletics, dogmatics, and therefore the formulation of creeds and confessions are subordinate to the Word of God. The Word of God, or simply the Scripture, or the 66 books, interpret themselves and protects Christians from being misled. God's Word is the lamp upon their feet. The Old Testament context prevented the Old Covenant people, Israel, from misinterpreting and misapplying the Old Testament. The New Testament context protects the New Covenant people, the Church, from misinterpreting and misapplying both the Old and the New Testament. However, it is the Gospel that is the ground of all Christian application and Christian ethics. Knowing now the different sources of theology, let us review our theological process. As you can see, the other sources have the tendency to influence our theology, but they are mostly subjective, yet we tend to read them into what the scripture is actually saying. This is called ACGesis, but with God's grace, prayer, discipline, and training, may we learn to properly exegete or read from the scriptures what God is actually saying. To know God purely from his word, but seconded and confirmed only by the other sources, this is the most challenging task for every theologian.